addicted to not forgiving somebody. It's a nectar, it's a poison that feels so good because I'm holding this and I'm making you suffer for what you did to me. And people hold on to it because they're getting some sort of nourishment, some sort of kick out of it. It's doing something for their, for them, some dark nectar that they're getting. They're, they're feasting, they're drinking, they're getting drunk off of this. But all the while it is poisoning their entire system and not doing anything to the other person. We want to welcome everybody here this morning and welcome our online community that are gathering from all around the world. Hello. Let's welcome our online community, Kingdom Rock, with a round of applause. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for being a part of today's service. We know the Lord has a rich and relevant word that will definitely change and inspire your life. Thank you so much for being a part. And don't forget to go to our website at kingdomrock.org. It's there that you can click the gift button and also leave us a comment, your prayer request, and connect with us. Amen. We'd love to hear from you. All right. So this morning, we want to speak from the subject that really of the warning of there's a snake in the grass. There is a snake in the grass. If I were telling you that there was a literal snake in the grass and you were outside in the, your front yard, wouldn't you take notice? Yes. Wouldn't you look around for it? Yes. You would be cautious, right? Yes. I'm telling you that there is a snake in the grass. Now, again, I'm not speaking of a literal snake right now, but one that is very spiritual. A spirit that desires to take your place, to rob you of your position. Now, the Lord will allow these things to happen to test your, to, uh, test your uh, fidelity, to test your faithfulness. He will allow it to come. Now, faithfulness and, or fidelity has to do with how well you are rooted where you are. Before he releases another round of glory, he wants to see are you rooted. Now, the Lord already knows your condition. He already knows your heart. You do not yet know it. And the devil does not yet know it. So he will allow these things to come to test where you are. This snake in the grass is a spirit of offense. It's a spirit of offense. And I'm telling you now prophetically, guard yourself from the spirit of offense. This spirit of offense slithers into households and threatens the relationships of mothers and daughters, fathers and sons, wives, husbands and wives, grandparents and grandchildren. It threatens your work on the job. It threatens your work at school. And it will even manifest itself in the church. For some reason, we are, we are taken aback. They say, well, I was hurt in church. Why don't you go anymore? Because I was hurt in church. That's why I don't go to church anymore. The spirit of offense slithered in and it wraps itself around that individual. And if the offense is not dealt with, let me do it this way. If the offense is not dealt with, offense, if it's not dealt with, it turns to hurt. And if the hurt is not dealt with, the hurt turns to bitterness. You become bitter, bitter, bitter and hurt. All of these are footholds of the enemy. He designs to have a place in you so that he can contaminate you and contaminate the lives that are around you. Let's go into some scripture today. So before we go any further, I want you to say, I will guard my heart, guard my heart against, the against the spirit of offense. Of offense. As a matter of fact, right now, let's take authority. Father, we as a congregation and the people take authority over the spirit of offense. 
We bind it in the name of Jesus. We forbid it to operate in us and among us. We take full authority over you in the name of Jesus. And we cast you from this place. We have discerned you by the Spirit. And you shall not take root in us or among us. We come against you in the name of Jesus. Once a spirit has been discerned, you have the responsibility to deal with it. To deal with it. You don't let it just sit there. If you have a cut on your hand, and maybe you're somewhere outside, and maybe you were uh, doing something in the yard, and there was a nail, and that nail was very rusty, and you cut yourself on that nail so deep that you see that white meat. That's real deep. And if you just walk away, oh, it'll be all right. It'll be all right. It'll be all right. I'm not going to do anything. I've been hurt. It'll be all right. I won't say anything. It'll be all right. It'll be all right. It's, look, it stopped bleeding. It'll be all right. It'll be all right. No, it's not going to be all right. You got to go somewhere and get that seen about. Get that looked at. Get yourself tested. Hopefully you've had a techno shot, techno shot. That you can deal with that. You cannot allow hurts to go on without attending to it. Because hurts will turn into bitterness. Hurts turn to bitterness. Bitterness is where the devil plays. And he will rob you of your place. How many friendships have ended because of offense? How many marriages have ended because of offense. How many people, like we said before, have left the church, left their jobs because they've been offended? The devil wants to take your place. He wants to rob you. And remember, offense comes to test your fidelity, to test your faithfulness. Are you rooted? Are you grounded? Now, inside of offense, you'll find that offense itself is rooted in pride. You hurt me. You hurt me. You did this to me. Now, when humans are offended, when we are hurt, the first thing we want to do is hurt. We want to tell you what you did. And we're waiting for your response because we want to hurt you. We want to make you pay for what you have done. You will pay for hurting me. Online community is mighty quiet today. <laughs> offense. This is what the spirit of offense does in the heart of a human being, whether you're saved or unsaved. You hurt me, so therefore you will pay for your sin against me. That's what, that's what it is, really. You have sinned against me. You have hurt me. You will pay. I will make you pay. And when I've seen that you've suffered enough, then I will release you. Can I tell you that that is the spirit of the devil? Because anytime you make somebody pay for their sins, you're doing something that you didn't do with Christ. Jesus did not make you pay for your sins. When you seek to make someone pay and you're going to suffer for what you did. Did Jesus do that to you? And I guarantee you, you did far greater sin. Far greater sin. So when you seek to make someone pay, make someone suffer, you're going to withhold forgiveness. You're not going to talk to them. You're not going to do this. You're not going to do that because of what you did. You're coming with another spirit. And when you're in another spirit, you're dwelling in darkness. And what you don't realize is that hordes of demons are now surrounding you. They have now come in to devour. Natural bodies eat natural things. You're a human being, you eat food. Living things 
eat. Spirits will gorge themselves on negative things, evil things. They are attracted. When you keep all of this in, they are attracted to you and you will feed them. Bitterness in your heart feeds a bitter spirit. Anger feeds an angry spirit. You feed them and so they'll latch on and they'll just... Like some leech sucking life out of you, sucking life out of you, sucking life out of you. So always remember that certain spirits are attracted to certain behaviors. If you act godly, guess what? The holy angels are attracted to you. They are attracted to you. They come around you. They want to see you. Because you look like God, look like the creator, look like him. But when we act like the devil, take on his characteristics, we begin to attract those that are like him. And spirits will feed. You got me? So again, when you're dealing with the spirit of offense, let me give you one way to really now we're going to do talk about several things. But let me give you one way the Lord gave to me in Psalm 119. Psalm 119. This is one way you're going to keep this spirit at bay. Always remembering this. Psalm 119 verse 165. Now remember this thing comes to test your fidelity, to test your faithfulness. Are you rooted? Are you ready for the next wave of glory? Listen, Psalm 119 verse 165 says this. We can all read this together. It's a very short verse. Let's read it together. Let's go. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Nothing shall offend them. Great peace. One thing about offense, it takes your peace away. It robs you of peace. When you are offended, you become angry. You become resentful. You become touchy. It robs you of life. Those things are sucking and sucking and sucking and sucking and inserting poison and poison and poison into your soul. Now, if something gets in your soul, it's only a matter of time before it has, it shows its effects on your physical body. What happens in the spirit, you'll find happening in the natural. When you remove those little suckers off of you, when you remove those leeches off of you, you notice, I've got more energy. I feel better. When you're no longer mad at somebody, when you're no longer holding a grudge at somebody, you feel a lot better. What happened? Well, you changed the frequency and those little suckers just fell off. And now what was taking energy from you is gone. Are you hearing? Great peace have they. Great peace. Who wants great peace? Great peace have they that love thy law. That love thy law. And nothing shall offend them. Now, when you talk about loving the law, and of course the law is definitely the word of God. But I want you to consider this. That the law is what put Jesus on the cross. Keeping the law of God does not mean not sinning. Keeping the law of God means that you will do the necessary or you'll pay the necessary fine or you'll make the necessary sacrifices to stay in the graces of God. Keeping the law means that you will conform to its rules and regulations when you sin. So loving God's law means to see what Jesus did for us means to see what we did to him 
upon the cross. When you realize, great peace have they that love thy law. My God, Lord, what you've done for me. What I caused to happen to you. My sin puts you upon that cross. My sin caused you to go into, the, into hell and to suffer for me, burning up my sins. My sins. See, if you don't see it as your sin, someone else's sin, if you don't see it as yours, what you've done to him, then when somebody does something to you, you have no frame of reference. If you don't remember what you did, you know, when somebody cuts me off, my wife and I were riding, we had to get some ice cream yesterday. I told her, uh, honey, let's, let's go get some ice cream. She said, it's my day off. I want to be at home. I said, okay. She called me back later. Uh, I'm ready. <laughs> Ask my wife. She loves me. So went up the road to get some ice cream. I got some of you wondering. I got some strawberry, um, strawberry lemonade sherbet. It was really good. I digress. <laughs> and as we were coming up the road, this car, this van just flew out in the middle of the road, just tore out. Well, I almost hit him. The person behind me, someone in front almost hit him, and they just run up, went on the road. The natural thing is to, ah, ah, what's wrong with you, buddy? No, my thought is, hey, I've done something dumb like that, too. Maybe they weren't thinking. Maybe they had a lot on their mind. I remember what I did. Hallelujah. I'm going to release grace to you because I remember what I did. I remember what I did. Anybody ever make dumb mistakes while you're driving? You get out there in the middle of the road. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. I should have waited. Wish I had waited. Wish I had waited. Wish I had. And you're out there in the middle of the road and cars blum, blum, blum. Uh, uh, somebody. Oh, boy. Yeah, I forgive you because I remember what I did. Great peace have they that love thy law. I remember what I did. So nothing shall offend me. I release you, yeah. I release you. I hold in remembrance what Jesus did for me. I hold in remembrance what my sin did. How he was beaten, how he was whipped, how he was abused, how he was betrayed for my sin. You have to say that for you. He did this for me. Say he did it for me. He did it for me. You say, well, the Lord died for the whole world. Uh-uh, baby, you need to bring it right here to you. Right here to you. When you do that, you will know how much he loves you. How much he suffered for you. Great peace have they that love thy law. And the law is what Jesus had to come to fulfill. He fulfilled the law on our behalf, taking our sins away, hung upon that cross, bled, beaten, bled, and tied. Rose the third day for me. You have to say he did it for me. He did it for me. So when I remember what my sins had done to him. Yours are a light offense. Don't worry about it. It's okay. Now, dealing with offense, you're going to get into your, what that snake does, that spirit does, it tries to get under your skin into your emotions. It has an emotional component. You cannot allow it to stay in your emotions. You cannot allow that to fester in you emotionally. It has, first of all, the mental component. I know what happened. I can't believe he did that. I can't believe she did that. I can't believe. Mental component. If you let it stay there, 
it goes down to emotionally. It gets right in your soul and the pain, your heart begins to bleed. Sorrow begins to break out. Sorrow begins to break out. Now, if you sit with a bloody heart, if you sit in silence with a bloody heart, that blood will harden and become bitterness. When bitterness sets in, you don't want to see them. You don't want to talk to them. Don't touch me. Don't call me. Anger comes up because bitterness has set in. And when that anger, which is not righteous anger, that anger comes in, along with it comes the demons, comes the devils. And it's their goal to load your mouth up with their words. And now you're speaking by the spirit, all right, but it is not the Holy Spirit. Are you hearing you must guard yourself against the spirit of offense. Why? Because it desires to have your place, to take your place. It does not want you to prosper. It does not want you to move forward. It does not want you to increase. It does not want your marriage to work. It does not want your ministry to work. It does not want your business to work. Its desire is to contaminate, to uh, infiltrate, contaminate, and destroy so that you are left at the end. Alone, hurt, angry, so angry, having nothing. Are you hearing? Let's go to Ephesians. Let's go to Ephesians. I love this as well. One verse in Ephesians. Ephesians, the fourth chapter, let's look at two verses, verse 26 and 27. Look at this, it says, Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let's look at that same verse out of the Amplified. I love the way it brings it a little bit closer to us. It says, do not give the devil, verse 27, that is, do not give the devil an opportunity to lead you into sin by holding a grudge or nurturing anger or a what? Harboring resentment or cultivating bitterness. Do not give the devil an opportunity. Give him no place. When the offense comes, remember what Jesus did for you. Remember what you did. Remember and release that. What should you do when you are offended? You need to give your offense, first of all, give it to the Lord. I've been offended. I've been offended. I want to give this. I don't want to throw it away. I'm just not going to think about it. I'm just not going to think about it. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Don't worry. I'm just not going to think about it. I'm just not going to think about it. That's exactly what the devil wants you to do. Why? Because he will go along and pick that offense up. And he'll say, remember when? Remember when? Remember when? Remember what he did? Remember what they did? Remember, remember, remember. But if I take that same offense instead of throwing it away and say, I'm not going to think about it, but actually you will be thinking about it. Instead of that, we give it to the Lord. Father, this is what happened. I release this to you. But what happens later on? 
You get angry again. You say, I thought I released it to the Lord. You release part of it. Because offense can often come in layers. Just like onions. You gave him the top layer. You feel it again. Lord, I give this to you. And you feel it again. Lord, I give this to you. And when it comes up again, Lord, I give this to you until all of it has been released into his presence. And when it's all released in his presence, the devil has access to none of it. And then your heart is free. Once your heart is free and you've released it to God, you have forgiven the offender, those who have sinned against you. You've forgiven them. You know this because every time the hurt has come up, you've given it to the Lord and your heart is at peace. You go to the offender not to force them or not to compel them to hurt. You did this to me and you ought to know what you did to me. In an effort that they may pay for their sins. Making them pay for their sins. It seems seem like when we go to somebody and we want to tell them what they did, we want to see a response. We want to see some tears. We want to, we want to see it. I want you to know what you did. Let me see some sorrow in your eyes. Come on. Let me see it. We want you to suffer like we suffered. But again, that's another spirit. Because Jesus didn't say to you, I want you to suffer because of what you did to me on the cross. That's another spirit. Are you hearing? No. I've already forgiven you of what happened. You cut me off. But you know what? I've already forgiven you. I just want to let you know. I feel that I have an obligation to to tell you. Are you hearing? Sometimes you need to do that. And at the appropriate time, you may do that to tell the individual. Because the Lord tells you that in Matthew 18. If your brother offends you, go to him and him alone. I'm not coming to you to, to get you to... For you to say, oh, I was wrong, da, da, da. The matter is already dealt with. I want you to know I've forgiven it. It's done. I'm over with. It's over with. You got me? Let's look a little bit further. Now, why are we doing this today? Why, why are we going through this today? Because the Lord has said, I believe with all my heart, that the Lord has said, there is a snake in the grass. There's a spirit of offense that desires to have your place. It wants to stop you. It wants to stop your ministry, your money. It wants to stop your marriage. It wants to take from you. It wants you to become hard. So hard that you are now untouchable, unreachable. So hard, as a matter of fact, that it can become to the point that you don't know how you feel about so and so anymore. The layers upon layers upon layers upon layers upon layers upon layers of unattended to hurt have turned to bitterness and bitterness and layers and layers and layers. You don't know how you feel anymore. Because it hasn't been dealt with. It takes the spirit to go in and to root out that emotion, to root this stuff out of you and really bring deliverance. Are you hearing Let's go to Matthew. Let me show you some things here. There are other consequences for not releasing forgiveness. And we've said this before, and I'm, let me, it bears witness to say it again. When you forgive somebody for what they've done, it is not for them. It is for you. When you refuse to forgive, it makes you stuck in that event. You replay that event over and over and over and over and over and over again. The devil will make sure that you hear it over and over and over and over. As a matter of fact, when you meet someone else new and they do something slightly resembling what the other person did to you, you remember that and it goes over and over and over and over and over and over and and you're Stuck right in that spot. 
never able to trust, never able to, to go into other relationships to this and that and the other because of the hurt that we're still holding. It will replay over. It. It's stuck. Stuck. Why am I stuck? Why, why am I stuck? It's because of unforgiveness. Because there was an offense that we deal not that we did not deal with. Are you with me? Matthew, the sixth chapter. Let's go a little bit deeper. Matthew six. Let's look at verses. We're going to look at the King James Version. Then we're going to look back at the Amplified. You know this very well. I'm just going to read it. Matthew six, verse nine through uh, 15. It says this. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory Forever. Amen. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. I want you to notice something because this has tripped up a lot of people that really haven't, that really didn't understand. So I want to make sure that you understand. There are two types of forgiveness that is now in operation in this verse. People seem to cling to the forgiveness as it relates to salvation. But there is also forgiveness as it relates to time, temporal, now. The main fact that Jesus said, this is how I want you to pray, pray our Father denotes that you have relationship with God. What Jesus did on your cross, what Jesus did for you upon the cross is permanent. It is unchanging. If you are indeed saved, if you have indeed received the finished work of Christ, if Jesus is your atoning sacrifice, he's the Lamb of God who has taken away your sins, then he has done that. He's taken away, he, he has taken away your sins. You are forever forgiven. Let's go here just for a moment. We know from the book of Hebrews that in, in, and in the Old Testament, uh, at the end of the year, the day of atonement, the high priest would come up and he, he would get a lamb or bull, what have you, and he would sacrifice that lamb for the sins of the people that have that occurred that year. Right? End of the year. He sacrifices for the sins of the people that occurred that year to cover the entire nation. So we can be in right standing with God as as we go into the next year. Jesus said, well, the Bible says in Hebrews that Jesus didn't come at the end of the year. He came, he went to the end of time, the end of the age, the end of all time, not the end of the year like a high priest did. Jesus went to that only cover the high priest, only to cover the sins for that year. Jesus went to the end of time. There's nothing else that way. There's, there was no future. He went to the end of time and presented his own blood before the Father, covering all time. Not the end of the year, but at the end of time. One sacrifice good for all time so when he said I've washed away your sins when he says you are forgiven because of my blood that's forever you are forever forgiven you're forever in right standing with God because of the blood of Jesus so if you have received him if he has in fact washed your sins away he has his he is your 
atoning sacrifice. He was your scapegoat. He died for you on the cross. You have received that. You believe that. You're not just a church goer. You're not just a good moral person, but you actually receive Jesus Christ as a son of God, as the Messiah, as the Savior of the world, the one who died to save you and rose for your justification. You are forever forgiven. And the Bible calls you now the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. This is why he said, this is how I want you to pray. Our father. Because he knew at this point what he was about to do for you and I. I am forgiven. That being settled, he then begins to talk about uh, how we need to relate to each other. And how if we don't relate to each other the same way the Father has related to us, then there are consequences in this time, not in eternity. The blood has already covered us eternally. But there are consequences now in this time for not forgiving. It's already baked in. Because the Lord wants us to be perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect, who causes the sun to shine on the just and unjust, who causes the rain to fall down upon the just and unjust. He freely forgives, and he wants us to do the same. He wants us to forgive one another just as he has forgiven us. So he starts the prayer off by saying, say, our Father. Jesus has realigned you. You are now in a oneness with God through what he's done. Then he goes on down to say how we need to relate to one another. He says, forgive us of our debts, the things that we are doing, these these momentary lapses, these sins. Forgive us of our sins as we forgive those that have sinned against us. Forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. One of the things that this will help bring this closer to you, too, one of the things the high priest would do as well, not only at the end of the year, but also throughout the year when people sinned, they would do offerings throughout the year, send offerings throughout the year to cover all these little things that people would do throughout the year. But that one final sin got them all in right relation. Even though you are eternally forgiven, you're still going to sin. You will still sin. Even though God calls you a saint, you are still a sinner. You're still sinning. The difference between you and the worldly is that you are a sinner Saved by grace. Now, God is perfecting you, making you holy every single day. The things that you used to do, some of those things, you don't do them anymore. That's the work of the spirit in your life as he's cleansing you and washing you. But this is an ongoing process. Not only will you sin against God, but you will also sin against other people. And the Lord includes this in the prayer. He says, Father, I want you to forgive me of my debts, my sin debt, as I forgive them of their sin debts. One characteristic of those who have been forgiven is that they forgive Jesus told that when he was invited to, uh, I believe, Simon's house, who Simon was the, uh, one of the Pharisees, invited him over for dinner. And the woman comes in, who was a notorious sinner in the land, and she comes in a weeping and a crying, and she washes his feet right with her tears, dries him with her hair, and the Pharisee gets offended and says, Jesus, if this man were a prophet, then he would have known what kind of woman this is and would not have allowed her to touch him. Aren't you glad that Jesus will allow the sinner to touch him? My God, if we had to be holy in order for Jesus to touch us, we'd never be touched. 
But isn't that the mindset of a Pharisee? Isn't that the mindset of a Pharisee? You've got to be completely right with me, completely right, do completely right, then I'll show you some affection. That's not the mind of God. The Lord is a master at looking beyond your faults and seeing your need. He wants us to have that same mind. Are you hearing? So we are to, uh, going back to that case with the woman, uh, um, the Lord talked to Simon. He said, Simon, see this woman? He said, yeah. He, Jesus said, I got something to say to you. He said, say on. Say, you, basically, you see this woman? Her sins are many. They are forgiven. And he told him a parable in there, and you can read it later on. He said, um, those who are forgiven much love much. Those who have been forgiven of much loves much. You realize that you've been forgiven of much? Anyone that has been forgiven by God was forgiven of much. There's no one that has been forgiven of little. We've all offended God. We've been forgiven much. And he said, those who have received, who have been forgiven much, loves much. Those that are forgiven, truly forgiven, have a tendency to forgive. Because again, they know what they did. And it's easy for me to forgive you when you sin against me. Because I know what I did when I sinned against him. And those who cannot forgive, they say, they say, they're born again, they say, I cannot forgive you. That snake is wrapped around your eyes. That you can no longer see the cross and the price that Jesus paid for you and how your sins put him upon that cross. Great peace have they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Now, as the offender, because we will offend people. Two things are true in this life. There are many others. One thing is definitely true. You will be offended. And you will also offend. You will be on both sides of that coin. Just a matter of time. To say it's never going to happen is a foolish thought. You will be offended again. Hopefully not before the day is out. You'll be offended again. And you will also offend somebody else again. You will hurt someone else again. The only way to avoid that is for you to die. Or go on some desert island somewhere. And don't talk to anybody. Don't go around anybody. Then maybe you won't offend them. Maybe they won't say, where's so-and-so? It's my birthday. I'm mad at them. And you're not even around. You're in some desert island somewhere. I don't know what people would do. But understand something. You will, you will either be offended or you will be the offender. The grace you give when you are the offender, or rather when you are offended, the grace you give when you are offended, I release you, brother. I release you. Will come back to you when you are the one that is the offender. Am I saying that correctly? The grace you give when you are offended, I release you. It's going to come back to you when you're on the other side of that. The same measure you meet with all shall be measured back to you. Don't worry about it. I love you. I love you. You know, I love you. I love you too, brother. You got me? Thank you, preacher. Let's look at this out of the Amplified Bible. Matthew 6 out of the Amplified. Y'all still with me today? There's so much to say on this. 
Matthew 6, look at this out of the Amplified Bible, verses 12 through 15. It says this, And forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors, letting go of both the wrong and the resentment. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive others their trespasses, their reckless and willful sins, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, nurturing your hurt and anger with the result that it interferes with your relationship with God, then your Father will not forgive your trespasses. Now again, the Lord says again, he keeps saying that he is Father, 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 denoting right relationship with him. But there's something that is tampered with in this time. When we refuse, when we refuse to release forgiveness, when we hold on to the offense, something is also being held from you. When we hold on to it and become hurt and become bitter, something is also being withheld from you. If we do not release, then God will not release. Which means that you can actually live in hell and die and go to heaven. Why do I say that? Because if he is father, if the blood of Jesus has been applied to your life and you're truly born again and you refuse to forgive, yeah, the soul is still saved. But you're allowing the devil to come in and to corrupt your life. And there's so much more that father wants to release to you, but because you refuse to release, he does not release. The Bible says it like this as well. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Does that make sense? But again, offense is intoxicating. It's like a drug. It's like a drug and you can get addicted to not forgiving somebody. It's a nectar. It's a poison. That feels so good because I'm holding this and I'm making you suffer for what you did to me. And people hold on to it because they're getting some sort of nourishment, some sort of kick out of it. It's doing something for, their, for them, some dark nectar that they're getting. They're, they're feasting, they're drinking, they're getting drunk off of this. But all the while it is poisoning their entire system and not doing anything to the other person. But those who really love you, who give their, I mean, those who would give their life for you. I'm not talking about those who, casual acquaintance, but those who love you, who would easily lay their lives down for you in a heartbeat. When you hold unforgiveness against them, you see that after a while it begins to worry them. It begins to get to them. And they will, because they love you, they're going to try their best to get back into your favor. They're trying to pay to make themselves righteous in your sight. They want to pay for their salvation. And you're causing them to do something that God never did to you, which is of another spirit. Does that make sense? Instead, we ought to forgive as God has forgiven us freely. Do you deserve, did you deserve to be forgiven? No. Did I deserve to be forgiven? No. No way in this world. 
I did not deserve to be forgiven. Again, did you desire, did you deserve to be forgiven? Did you do anything to merit God's unmerited favor, to, to earn his love and his grace for you? Did you do anything at all? No. He freely loved, freely forgiven, freely justified. That's exactly how he wants us to do with each other. Let's go one more scripture that we're going to close out for today. I really want you to get this because, again, there is a spirit of offense. There is a snake in the grass that desires to take your place. It wants to take your place. It wants to get you out. Get you out of your place of authority. Get you out of that relationship. Get you out of that job. Just before you're about to be promoted, just before you're about to win, here comes that snake that has been released to test your fidelity, to test your faithfulness, to see if you're really rooted in this thing. But how many left just before the breaking of dawn, they left. Why? Because I was hurt. I was offended. And then you go, got to go start all over again. And see, the thing about offensive is not dealt with. You also find it in any other place, too. Because if the devil was successful running you off the first place, hmm, I'm going to run you out of this place with that same thing. And run you out of and the same thing over here. And you'll be on your eighth marriage. Blaming all those other people. I don't know. I keep picking the wrong ones. Baby, it's not them and you. Do you understand it? Your A church, your A job, all oh, trying to find the perfect one, trying to find the perfect pastor. There's only one perfect pastor, and his name is J E S U S. Other than that, you have flesh that are trying their hard to be like Jesus, just like you. Just like you. If you don't extend grace, you won't receive grace. Realize that people are flawed. Church are flawed because it's filled with flawed people. But if you find the people that are flawed, that are sinning, that have a heart toward God and reaching out for God. Lord, I've sinned. I've fallen short. Lord, change me. Change me. Baptize me afresh with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Change me, Lord. Change me, Lord. Change me, Lord. Make me like you. Make me like you. Make me like you. And it's their heart's desire and their heart's cry, but yet still they still fall. Oh, but they get up. They fall. Oh, but they get up. If you find that, you found the best thing in life. But if you find those that pretend, I never do anything wrong. I am, I'm good. That reminds me of a man. He was sitting outside on a stoop on the church steps, and he was crying and crying and crying. Jesus walks up to him and sits down next to him and says, why are you crying? The man said, they won't let me into the church. And Jesus puts his arm around him and says, don't worry, they won't let me in either. Are you hearing? Church is full, full of people that have issues that are crying out to God. And when so many have issues, 
Sooner or later, you're going to hurt somebody else. You're going to hurt them and you're going to be hurt. But the grace that you give when you are hurt is the same grace that you will receive when you hurt somebody else. If you make them pay for their sin, that same thing is going to be coming right back around to you. Are you hearing? Let's do one last one. Matthew 5. I want you to see this. Matthew 5, verse 22 through 26. You must be prepared for that snake in the grass. You must remember Psalm 119. Great peace have they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. I'm not telling you to tattoo it on your body. Tattoo it on your soul. Are you understanding? Amen. Matthew 5, verse 22 through 26. It says this. But I say to you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, that means empty head, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Look at verse 23. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother have aught against you, you remember that your brother has something against you, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way, and be reconciled. In other words, to change or to renew friendship with one to thy brother and then come and offer thy gift. That's how tight this thing is. God said, before you raise your hands to worship me, if you realize you got something, realize somebody mad at you, you realize that you, have a, that you are the offender, go and get it right. And then come back and see me. For you, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Lord says, you remember what you did. And listen, it's hard eating crow. It's hard admitting when you were wrong. I was wrong. I sinned. I acted like a fool. I was extremely immature. I did not mean to hurt you. Please forgive me. It's hard eating that. Why? Because pride is still alive in you. But with every encounter, pride dies. Every time you say it. Now again, if you're the one that has been hurt and they come to you in sincerity of heart and you brush them away, then again, that same thing is coming right back around to you. If you keep that unforgiveness, if you refuse to release them of their sin, then you're also being, something is being withheld from you. Let's look a little bit further. I want you to see this, and we're going to close out in verse 25. So the Lord says again, he said, before you worship, get that right. Before you worship with your offering, Get that right. And it is hard to marry. It is hard. It is hard to admit that you've been wrong. But when you do, you ask God to give you the strength. It's embarrassing. It's awkward. But as you ask for forgiveness, you're the offender. If they turn you down and say, I'm never going to forgive you, well, then you have done your part. Go in peace. Go in peace. You've done it. Okay? God does not require you to do anything else apart from that. He requires you to come to him with a sincere heart. 
Father, forgive me for what I've done. Forgive me, Lord. I repent. I repent. And they move on from there. Are you hearing? Look at verse 25. Verse 25 talks about the spirit things that happen in the, not only in natural, there's some natural applications here, but I want you to see the spiritual things. Verse 25 says, agree, that is, be thou with or agree with or be present with thine adversary. Your adversary is an opponent and a lawsuit, an enemy. He says, agree or be there with your opponent or with the one that is suing you. Quickly, agree with him quickly, whilst thou art in the way with him, least at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. Verse 26, verily I say unto, unto thee, thou uh, shalt by no means come out thence till thou hast paid the uttermost furthing. Let me read that to you out of the Amplified Bible. Verse 25 says again, Come to terms quickly with your, with your accuser while you are on the way traveling with him. Least your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Now, there is a safeguard that God gives to those that have been offended. Hear this. When someone offends you, as we said, you give it to the Lord. Don't fester it. Don't hold it. Don't put it out of your mind. Give it immediately to God. Who is God? He is the judge. The judge then goes and acts on your behalf. The judge goes to work on your behalf. One of the worst things you can ever do, you can ever do, is to offend a child of God. Because the child of God has access to the judge. This is why the Lord says, when you offend someone, go quickly. Hey, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Please don't tell Papa. On, please don't tell me. Please don't tell Papa on me. Please, please don't tell the judge. I'm sorry. Yeah, don't tell daddy, please. Please don't. Please forgive me. Now, if I'm coming sincerely and I'm saying that because father's hearing it all, hearing the whole conversation. I'll release you. I'll release you. I'll release you. If you don't deal with it quickly, they have authority. I have the authority. I have the right to take my offense to the judge. Father, this is what happened to me. This is what they did. And I forgive them. You see, because you, because you really can't give this to God unless you forgive it. Yeah, that's good. Because forgiveness is releasing. Here it is, God. No, I know you're trying to take it, but I'm going to keep it, but I want you to know about it. You have to submit this to the court. As you have to release it to the court. Yes. I have to let it go. Yes. I've forgiven. I've released this to the court. And then the court takes the calls up and deals with the offender. There's protection for the ones who have been offended. To the offender, the Lord says, agree with him quickly while you're in the way, while you're walking with him, when it happens. You know you did it. You know you said it. Don't sit on this thing for a few hours. Don't sit on this thing for a few days, a few weeks, and just don't say nothing. I just won't say nothing. I just won't say no, 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 no. Don't sit on it. Go quickly. Forgive me. I was wrong. Forgive me. I'm sorry. I repent. Lease your case it's escalated to the judge Amen. and the judge hands it over to the officer and the officer puts you in jail. The same thing happens there in the book of Matthew 18 chapter when the Lord talks about the king that uh, the the wicked servant that did not 
Well, the king forgave this servant of all the big debt. You remember that? All the debt. But the servant went out and he did not forgive his, serve, his fellow servant the old just a little bit. At the end of that, that servant that held the unforgiveness was cast into prison. Torment is released. Now, the torment is actually working on your favor because now God is dealing with you. You need to go back and say something to so-and-so. You know what you did. You need to go back and say something to so-and-so. It's not going to release you until you get it right. We can grieve the Holy Spirit so much by not adhering to the Lord and getting that thing right. You can release torment into your life you can release hell into your life by simply refusing to let it go and give it to God. There's a snake in the grass, but I pray today that you will not be offended, that it will not be able to coil itself around you, that it will not be able to uh, be a, a tick, a spiritual tick, or a, or a spiritual slug on you, or leech draining you of life they will not be able to stick on you because you've given that thing to the Lord give it to God quickly